The Vatican holds many secrets, including a library with information that has been withheld from the public. It's safe to say that the Vatican is one of the most elite corporations in the world. Disguised as a Christian institution, Vatican City allegedly runs itself as a criminal empire. And through this criminal empire, many people have disappeared at the Vatican. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to our producers and our patrons here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without your funding of our work, we would not be able to do what we do. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. Manuela Orlandi was born on the 14th of January 1968. She was the fourth in line in a family of five children. Now it is stated that her father worked as a clerk in the pontiff's household, meaning that her father had a very important job with the Pope. The Pope at this time was John Paul II. Because of Emanuela's father's position in the Vatican City, Emanuela and her brothers and sisters pretty much had a free range of the Vatican gardens. Now, I've been to the Vatican City, and it literally is like a little neighborhood inside of Italy, even though it is its own independent state. As a parent, this seems like the perfect case scenario because your kids are literally stuck inside. They can't go anywhere but play within the boundaries of the Vatican. Emanuela's older brother often claimed that Pope John Paul II had a very close relationship with the children. Again, his father was one of his clerks and therefore Pope John Paul II knew each child personally. And in fact, during this time, it is said that only six families actually lived inside Vatican City, so it was a very close-knit community. Now, Emanuela often left the Vatican City to go into the city of Rome to take music lessons. It seems that she was a very talented flute player. At the time of her disappearance, she was 15 years old, a teenager old enough to know how to take care of herself when it came to traveling around Rome, Italy. It was common for Emanuela to take the bus by herself. And on the 22nd of June, 1983, Emanuela left Vatican City by bus to go and take a flute lesson. However, on this day, Emanuela never came back. According to her brother, the start of the 22nd was a bit of a rough day for Emanuela. It seems that she was running late and instead of taking the bus, had asked her brother if he would give her a ride into Rome. Now, her brother, of course, has stated that he feels really guilty about what transpired because he told Emanuela that he did not have time to take her into Rome and she was just going to have to be late for her flute lesson. Of course, I know that her brother feels guilty because I'm sure in his mind he has reconciled that if he was able to take Emanuela into Rome to her flu lesson, then maybe she would not have disappeared. I do think we all know that tragic accidents happen all the time, vanishings happen all the time, and it is obviously not the fault of her brother. After the flute lesson was over, Emanuela reportedly called her sister. She told her that right before her music lesson had started, a woman offered Emanuela a job to be a cosmetic representative for Avon makeup. Now, I know most of us know what Avon is. This is a multi-level marketing company that has been around for a really, really long time. We all know the slogan Avon Calling, where women would go door to door to sell makeup. For a young 15-year-old, I'm sure this job offered a lot of hope and financial success. 
At 15, you're not old enough to understand that sometimes multi-level marketing jobs do tend to work in a bit of a pyramid scheme and therefore a lot of people don't make a lot of money in these businesses. As she told her sister about this job offer, her sister told her that it was important that she spoke to their parents first before taking this opportunity. After she got off the phone with her sister, Emanuela walked to the bus stop with her friend. Her friend said that Emanuela was super excited about this potential job with Avon and that's all that she would talk about. The friend said she saw Emanuela get onto the bus where she proceeded to sit beside another passenger who reportedly had red hair. She could see Emanuela chit-chatting with this woman as the bus pulled away. However, Emanuela, Orlandi, never came home. Later that afternoon, Emanuela's parents started to grow concerned. This was not like Emanuela to be this late coming home from her music lessons. They called the police, but the police told them at that time that Emanuela was probably out with friends and not to worry that she would return home possibly later in the evening. Now again, this was in 1983. Things were a little bit different and we didn't have cell phones. So you had to find a pay phone. So I'm sure parents would call the police often when their kids were not home on time. And I'm sure the police were used to getting these calls only to have the child show up later that evening because the child had lost track of time and was of course hanging out with their buddies. But the next day, Thursday, the 23rd of June, Emanuela still was not home. Her parents frantically called the music school around 3 p.m. to see if they had heard from or seen Emanuela. At this point, the police decide to now officially file Emanuela as a missing persons. News outlets released information on Emanuela, including her parents' home phone number. Now in 2021, we would call this doxing, but I guess back in the 80s, this was seen as a practical step for anybody who had seen Emanuela to contact her parents immediately. On Saturday, the 25th of June, Emanuela's parents received a very interesting phone call. It was 6 p.m. in the evening and a presumed 16-year-old boy named Pierre Luigi called the family home and said that he and his girlfriend met Emanuela at the Piazza Navona. Now this is like a courtyard in Italy where people can congregate and hang out. In the phone call, he did mention her flute and also spoke about Emanuela's glasses. He claimed that this young woman that he saw claimed that she did not like her glasses. In fact, she hated them. Now, this is interesting because this information was not released to the public, but it was true that Emanuela hated her glasses but they were necessary from time to time. He said that she told him and his girlfriend that she had just gotten a new haircut. And she said her name was not Emanuela, but Barbarella. And this Barbarella was running away from home in order to be an Avon cosmetic seller. After the phone call with Pierre Luigi, the parents didn't hear anything else for a few more days. But on Tuesday, the 28th of June, they received another very interesting phone call. This was from a man who called himself Mario. Now, Mario owned a bar near the Vatican City and also close to the music school where Emanuela had been taking music lessons. He claimed that a young girl named Barbara came into his bar saying that she was now a fugitive from her family and she was gonna run off and again sell Avon cosmetics. However, she told Mario that she did plan on being back home for her sister's wedding. Once again, this was information that had not necessarily been shared with the public. Her sister was going to get married. However, as time passed, Emanuela, who allegedly was calling herself Barbara, did not show up for her sister's wedding. Two days later, on the 30th of June, in about a week since Emanuela disappeared, the city decided to put up missing posters. There were about 3,000 missing posters placed everywhere all over Rome. 
And by Sunday, the 3rd of July, Pope John Paul II publicly pleaded to whoever had Emanuela to bring her back home. This was the first time that the possibility of a kidnapping had been brought up to the public. After this, all hell broke loose because two days later, the family started to receive other anonymous phone calls. These phone calls claimed that Emanuela had been taken as a prisoner and they were holding her in order to make an exchange for another prisoner. This was the prisoner Mehmet Ali Agha. Mehmet Ali Agha was born on January 9th, 1958 in Turkey. Now he is known as a Turkish assassin because in 1979 he had a Turkish journalist. Once he was arrested for this Turkish journalist, he escaped prison in Turkey and made his way over to Italy to try to assassinate Pope John Paul II in 1981. Even though Pope John Paul II was injured from this attempted assassination, he was not obviously killed. But they did take Mehmet Ali Agha into custody. And according to these anonymous phone calls, now this group wanted to exchange Emanuela for Mehmet. The man who made these anonymous phone calls came to be known as the American because he had an American accent. Now, was he actually an American? I don't know. There are people out there that are really talented at mimicking different accents. If I were this guy, I would try to use an accent that was not my own. So there's still suspicion as to who this person actually was. Now, after the first phone call, where this whole plot had been explained, this American caller placed a voice recording through the phone of Emanuela speaking to try to prove to her parents and to the authorities that they were serious, that they had Emanuela in their custody. A few more days later, this anonymous American called back again. And he said that he was ready to negotiate the exchange, Emanuela for Mehmet. He also informed him that Pierre, Luigi, and Mario, the two other callers that had called in before the Pope made his statement saying they believed Emanuela had been kidnapped, were part of this group that had, in fact, kidnapped Emanuela. And the fact that these two guys, Pierre, Luigi, and Mario, knew such details about Emanuela, like the fact that she wore glasses, or the fact that her sister was getting married, lent some validity to the claims of this anonymous caller. By Wednesday, July the 6th, this same man called a local news station to report the exchange and his demands. He asked that the Pope, Pope John Paul II, participate in this exchange within the next 20 days. He also claimed that there would be a basket left near the Parliament building that carried proof of Emanuela being in their captivity. This included a photocopy of her music ID card from the music school, a receipt, and a handwritten letter from Emanuela herself. However, the magistrate handling this case did not believe that this anonymous caller had anything to do with Emanuela Orlandi's disappearance. He made this in a very public statement that they were not going to be following the leads of the people calling the family and making the demands for the exchange. But the phone calls did not end there. On Friday the 8th, of July, a man now with a Middle Eastern accent called a school classmate of Emanuela Orlandi. He informed this classmate that this classmate now had 20 days to provide the exchange, Mehmet for Emanuela. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had gotten a call like that at 15 years old, I probably would have crapped my pants. Hell, if I got a call like that at 38 years old today, I would probably still crap my pants, so my heart really does go out to this poor innocent kid.
that they just happened to know was a classmate and a peer of Emanuela. This Middle Eastern man asked that this young child arrange for a private phone line to be set up between this alleged group and the Secretary of State. The line was installed on the 18th of July, and after that, a series of 16 anonymous calls from this American again happened from different payphones around Italy. Despite all of this, there were no signs of Emanuela or Landy, and her case started to go cold. Now, Emanuela's brother always believed that the Vatican was behind his sister's disappearance. And I happen to believe her brother. After all, as I said in the opening, we know the Vatican is not what the Vatican has betrayed itself to be for all these years. Now, let's move forward and look at some of the theories and maybe see why Emanuela's brother still to this day believes that the Vatican was involved in her disappearance. So the first big theory is the Orlandi Agca theory, so the exchange for Emanuela and Mehmet, who tried to off the Pope back in 1981, about two years before Emanuela went missing. Now, from the very beginning, this was the main theory, right? Because we have all these phone calls coming in from all these mysterious people with different accents claiming that they want an exchange, Mehmet, for Emanuela. They must have been casing the place because they knew that Emanuela was close to the Pope. They knew her father worked directly with the Pope. So they knew that her disappearance would cause a lot of panic within the residents of the Vatican, including possibly Pope John Paul II himself. However, if we look deeper into the relationship between Mehmet and John Paul II, there is a huge question mark there because what we see is not what was really told to us through the media. Now with this theory, Emanuela Orlandi was kidnapped by a Bulgarian group called the Grey Wolves. Now the Grey Wolves are a Turkish neo-fascist youth organization that ATCA was allegedly a part of. Now during a prison interview with Mehet Ali Agka, he confirmed that Emanuela was still alive. Now, he claims that Emanuela was living in a convent closer to the German border. He said that he had no evidence of this, but he deduced it logically. But what does he mean by that? That he logically deduced that this is what happened to Emanuela. Why would he think that she would end up in a convent. After all, the Orlandi Agca theory was closed in July of 1997. However, even though the Orlandi Agca theory was closed in July of 1997, the honorary president of the Supreme Court of Italy, Ferdinando Impossimato, was eager to re-explore this theory by mid-2000. He believed and supports the Agca connection and thinks that Emanuela is now integrated into the Muslim community and probably spent a lot of time in Paris. Now as we get deeper into these theories and start to see where the dots connect, I do want to note that we know here in the United States the head of our Supreme Court has some interesting ties to Epstein's island. Now, I'm not saying anything about this guy from Italy. I don't know anything about this guy from Italy. But we do know now in this great awakening that our government, our religion, that all these big powerful corporations are all connected and they all have blackmail on each other regarding things that would happen in places like Epstein Island. In 2006, Mehet Ali Agka published a letter claiming that Emanuela Orlandi and another girl were in fact abducted to scare the Vatican and prompt his release from prison. Now, this other girl we will get into next week on our Mystery Monday. Now, once again in this letter, Mehmet Ali Aga claimed that these two girls were taken out of Italy into a German province perhaps again to a convent. Because four years later, Agka would go on to tell people 
that Pope John Paul II's attempted assassination and the kidnapping of these two girls were done by the Vatican. Now, Mahet Ali Agka and the Grey Wolves, their original target of Pope John Paul II is because they believed that he was the leader of the modern day Crusades and that Pope John Paul II was behind these attacks on the Grand Mosque in Mecca where Muslims go to pray. Now after Agka was arrested for the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II, he did end up converting to Catholicism in 2007. Now what's really interesting was that after Pope John Paul II recovered, he ended up going to the Italian prison that was holding Agka and talking with him privately. Now at the time, many people saw this as, as Pope John Paul II being this wonderful Christian and extending his forgiveness to the man who tried to have him killed. But now that we know what we know about the Vatican, I'm even more suspicious about the connection between Agka and Pope John Paul II, especially since Atka would go on to tell people that the Vatican was behind everything to begin with. Now, in this meeting with the Pope and Agka, there is a very famous photo of Agka kissing Pope John Paul II's ring. Kiss the ring, you know? This is, this is something that kings do, that people would do when they would show their servitude to a leader. And we know, we know now that the popes, the plural popes, have been the head of the beast since the very beginning. So what did Agka submit to in this private meeting with Pope John Paul II? We also know that Pope John Paul II very famously met with Agka's family. Agka spent about 19 years in an Italian prison. And then on the behest of Pope John Paul II, he was released. He was sent back to Turkey where he had to finish out his sentence for killing the Turkish journalist years before. Once he finished his time in the Turkish prison, Adka was allowed back into the Vatican City on the 27th of December 2014 to lay roses on the tomb of the now deceased Pope John Paul II. This was because recently, at this time, Pope John Paul II had been canonized as a saint. So here's this man that was part of this terrorist organization, allegedly, as what we, the public, were told by the media, that had tried to kill Pope John Paul II. He was sentenced to prison in Italy. He developed a relationship with Pope John Paul II where he kissed the ring. Pope John Paul II also established a relationship with this guy's family. And then, on the behest of Pope John Paul II, this guy was eventually released from an Italian prison around 2010. But prior to his release, we have all these people on the outside calling in to Emanuela Orlandi's family and the government saying that they have Emanuela and another girl that they're keeping captive in order to exchange these girls for Mehet Ali Agka. We know that the Pope was close to Emanuela Orlandi and to her father as well as her siblings. We also know that Emanuela Orlandi's brother has claimed that the Vatican is behind everything. The Vatican is the bad guy. The Vatican is behind not only the abduction of Emanuela Orlandi, but allegedly they were also behind the false flag of the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II. Second. Not only is Emanuela's brother claiming this, but now Agka himself is claiming this in 2010. But after he claims this, he's now allowed back into Vatican City to lay roses down on the tomb of his old buddy, Pope John Paul II, because now Pope John Paul II has been canonized as a saint. This is weird. Now I do have to mention another theory before we get to our final theory, which really is the icing on the cake. But this one other theory, I don't know has, I don't believe has anything to do with the case, but it is a theory out there. So I am going to bring it up. And this is the theory of organized crime. 
In 2011, a man named Antonio Mancini, who was a member of an organized crime group in Rome, just like the organized crime groups we have here in America, the Mafia, same, same. Well, he claimed that Orlandi's kidnapping was an attack against the Vatican in order to get the Vatican Bank to pay back money that the bank had borrowed. In 2012, the police opened the tomb of the gangster Enrico de Pettis. I hope I'm saying that right, because tips led the police to believe that they could find DNA that could add more clues to the case. However, nothing was found. But I do find it interesting that another separate theory also puts the Vatican as borrowing money from organized criminals. In the same year of 2011, another claim was made against the Vatican. And this claim was made by an 85-year-old exorcist who worked for the Vatican by the name of Father Gabriel Amor. He claimed that Emanuela Orlandi was kidnapped by the Vatican police and used for sex parties. And then, as we know, what happens with these elite sex parties, once the person has been used, they're then sacrificially done away with. Now it's important to note that this particular father was the head of exorcisms for the Vatican. In October of 2018, some remains of bodies were found at the Holy See's embassy as they were doing renovations. Now it did come back that these remains were not of Emanuela Orlandi, but rather of a Roman woman who lived during the second or third century, which I find super fascinating. And I don't know why people didn't expand on that more because wow, those are some old freaking bones that have been down there for a really long time. Now in July of 2019, the Vatican did say that they were gonna be opening up two graves in the Teutonic Cemetery, which is inside the Vatican City. And I am planning on doing a, a longer video about the history of this particular cemetery because it's really fascinating. But they had some tips come in that her remains might be in two graves under the heads of the angels. Now these particular graves were that of princesses. And when they went to go pull these graves up, there was no bodies to be found, not even the original princesses that were buried there to begin with. Of course, this all could have opened up a whole new mystery, like what the hell happened to these princesses, but as it turns out, the bodies of the princesses had just kind of been shifted a little bit during all the renovations and the time that had passed over in this area of Vatican City. This same thing happened in our one of our stories from a year ago that I did over in Savannah, Georgia, where bodies got kind of moved under cemeteries. Apparently this happened. You think you bury your grandpa in one area and then 500 years later, that body has moved to a whole new area. Now again, it's super interesting that with every theory put out there, the Vatican is nefariously involved in Emanuela Orlandi's disappearance. I believe her brother. I also believe Akka and his claims that the Vatican is behind everything. That Emanuela was used for something nefarious. That goes on within the Vatican City. Was her father involved? Were her family members of authority involved in this as well? I, I have no idea. I don't believe her brother or siblings were involved because they have been fighting to the nails to find out what happened to their sister. And her brother has openly pointed the finger at the Vatican. Now to date, no one has found any of her remains. But as time goes on, hopefully we will get some closure for Emanuela Orlandi and all the other missing kids that have gone missing because of the Vatican. My heart goes out to the Orlandi family. And I do hope for her siblings that there is some closure soon to what happened to their talented and beautiful sister. I personally believe that Emanuela Orlandi is probably not with us anymore. Wherever Emanuela Orlandi's spirit is now, I hope that it is able to rest in peace. I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below. And next Monday, we will look at part two into the other person that also allegedly went missing for the same reasons as Emanuela Orlandi. 
I hope you guys have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you so much again to Josh McKay for doing our opening song. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And thank you again to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.